This is Michael Popak of Legal AF. If you weren't a huge fan of Jack Smith before this hot take, you will be when I get done. Wait till you hear about the new reporting that has now come out about Jack Smith's meeting just days before his indictments in Mar-a-Lago and the one against Trump in the D.C. election interference case, when as a courtesy only, <laughs> he met with Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers, at least his new ones. John Lauro, been on the job for two weeks, and Todd Blanche met just hours before the indictment to try to stave off the indictment, headed off at the pass, and it was met with Jack Smith now. He has a reputation, Jack Smith, as having a sphinx-like demeanor, a visage, monosyllabic brooding. He's the Johnny Casher, Heathcliff of Wuthering Heights of prosecutors. And based on this reporting, uh, nothing's changed. This is how the meeting went. And here's the TikTok of it, you know, the traditional TikTok of it. Here's what happened over the timeline of the meeting. The meeting took place on the 27th of July, just this past summer. And in the meeting, it was attended by Lauro, John Lauro, new to the case at the time, just been hired, and Todd Blanche, who had just also joined as a, a new criminal defense lawyer for Donald Trump. They were met by Jack Smith and two of his trusted uh, prosecutorial colleagues that were on the team with him, J.P. Cooney and Ray Holser. They met in Washington, D.C., and here's how it went. I'm going to give you first the schematic or the formula, and then I'll get into a little bit more detail. It was pleasantries and a handshake, John Lauro uninterrupted for a um, one-hour period of a filibuster, right? An offer of water somewhere in there, absolutely no questions asked or comments made by the prosecutors, and then they said goodbye. <laughs> That was the entire uh, the entire event. No back and forth, no debate, just, okay, nice to meet you. Would you like some water? Please continue. One hour presentation, and I'm going to talk about the details of it because it tells us what the defense is going to be in the case. You're not going to be surprised by what I'm going to tell you, but I want you to hear it from me on this hot take so it's all in one place. And then, are you done? Thank you. The door is over there. <laughs> and then... I have to get up. Four hours later, literally four, like clock, four hours later, the superseding or second indictment comes out in Mar-a-Lago. Remember, that's the one that added to the butler, the body man uh, that was already indicted. It now added the maintenance head, Carlos de Oliveira, and then added the new counts related to the attempts by Donald Trump to obstruct justice in the investigation by destroying video evidence, surveillance evidence, using the maintenance worker, the butler, and an IT worker, Yusil Tavares, that's now cooperating with the government. So that happened. And then five days later after that meeting, because this meeting went so well uh, for Donald Trump, you have the actual indictment in the District of Columbia, four counts conspiracy against Donald Trump alone. And that's the one that's pending before Judge Chutkin. So that was how Jack Smith responded to John Lauro with a, with a twin fusillade of Boom! Superseding indictment, Mar-a-Lago, adding new claims and counts and people. Boom! New indictment, District of Columbia. So let me break down what happened there and what, and we'll do our own artist rendering. I've been in this room before. Not this particular room, but I've been in the room with federal prosecutors, uh, you know, trying to defend a client when you make a proffer or a presentation or you submit what we call a white paper, which is sort of a, an entire brief where you argue against certain charges or that the prosecution dropped the indictment or the, uh, the possible indictment altogether. Then you get in, you have a meeting and you make a presentation. But when you're Donald Trump's lawyers, whose prior lawyers were busy bashing Jack Smith round the clock, as Donald Trump does. You don't really have a lot of reservoir of goodwill or credibility when you enter that room. And you could tell by the chilly reception <laughs> that they got, you know, uh, it was it was pretty cold. I've been in a lot of rooms like the one I'm about to describe, and I've never had the government shake my hand, sit down, listen, and show me the door the way they did for Donald Trump. And that's not because there's two systems of justice. There's, you know, all this other BS that's being 
propagated by Donald Trump's proxies, proxies and Donald Trump. You know, there there are there is two tier there is a two two systems of justice in America, but it's for white people and black and brown people, not for white old guys that used to be president and everybody else. Um, they are the facts demand that he be indicted and prosecuted just like anybody else because nobody is above the law. That's the little <laughs> that's the little observation about our justice system that always seems to get stuck when the Trump uh, proxies talk about it. So here's what the argument that Lauro made during the, his one hour uninterrupted filibuster <laughs> to, to a sphinx like Jack Smith that just kind of sat there for it. He said, one, that Trump really believed that he had won the election and therefore he didn't have the requisite mens rea or mental criminal intent formed to be con- to be indicted for a crime. We know the amount of evidence now, both reflected in the indictment and released otherwise, and things that we know developing both in the Jan 6 committee report and in Georgia that makes all of that hogwash, right? There are, there are there are things that you do if you really believe and things that you say that you really believe, and none of that is what Donald Trump did. And then you, we have a concept in the law of willful blindness, which is you can't maintain in your mind that you are innocent under the onslaught right, of evidence to the contrary that any reasonable person would have accepted as true, right? You can't believe that you're living in the 1780s, right, in the Confederacy when you wake up tomorrow morning because the weight of the evidence that tells you that you're living in 2023 America, you know, doesn't allow you to maintain that thought in your head in order to defeat criminal intent, right? And so that's out the door. You know, if you're attorney general, assistant attorney general, deputy White House counsel, White House counsel, outside auditors that you hired, your cybersecurity head, uh, and, and everybody else that matters in government tells you there was no outcome determinative fraud that would have changed the outcome of the election, you are not allowed under the law to continue to maintain. Well, I think there was which is where Donald Trump is. So that was one. The second po- point on their PowerPoint presentation for Donald Trump is that he was just exercising his First Amendment rights. You can't criminalize the First Amendment, to which the obvious counter is there are things that are not covered or not protected by the First Amendment and participating in a coup and trying to subvert democracy and trying to undermine the peaceful transfer of power, even if you're using words to do it, which is how you know the, the, the Constitution doesn't envision criminals that are just uh, mimes and they just do pantomime. It's always words. There's always words in every crime. <laughs> They're not, you know, if I say to my fellow bank robber, hold, use this gun and hold that person in the corner, I have a First Amendment right under Donald Trump's theory to just tell my buddy to hold that guy over there with a gun. No. So First Amendment right is is obviously, didn't. I, I'm sure they didn't even blink, let alone blink an eye. They're just probably staring. The third is that um, Donald Trump bl- relied on or followed the advice of lawyers. That's why Jack Smith has been pushing, pushing, pushing to have Judge Chutkin get out on paper if they're going to rely on the advice of counsel because it was presented to them back in July, uh, July 27th. All of the lawyers, all of the lawyers that Donald Trump is going to claim to have relied on, if he's even able to do that, are either disbarred and or convicted criminals or soon to be, at least indicted. Um, and so that sort of undermines his ability to say that he reasonably reasonably relied on advice of counsel, having given them the full information necessary to render the opinion and then relying on that opinion, which is the factors you need to do for that particular element. And the fourth is that um, he already got impeached. <laughs> the Congress took care of this already. Uh, of course, he was acquitted by the Senate. He was impeached by the House managers, controlled by the Democrats, ultimately, but the Senate, controlled at the time by the Republicans, didn't see anything wrong with Donald Trump's behavior and conduct and absolved them. So they sort of made, I guess, a double jeopardy argument, which is, you know, he he got impeached already and he got absolved. Well, he only got impeached for the Jan 6th 
insurrection component, which is just one link in one link in a seven step plan. If you want to follow along with the Jan Six Committee and its reporting and what we believe from the indictment, that was just the the attempted coup de grace to try to stay in power when all else fell, blow up the Capitol. But the, he, he's he's not being indicted per se by the, for the Jan Six Committee I mean, by, for the Jan Six insurrection. It, it was very artfully handled in the indictment in D.C. election case not to be part of one of the crimes. And I think that's because of this argument about um, about double jeopardy that was raised. Because even though they were not speaking, the Department of Justice personnel and Jack Smith were taking notes for the presentation so they know what to expect. And then lastly, it was like this last pitch of mercy. Don't indict Donald Trump. It'll just further divide the country. And that was the whole, that went on an hour. You could see where that could take an hour. And then Mr. Smith stood up and said, thank you. Thank you for your time. And there's the door. And that was the end of it. And then the, uh, you know, then they, uh, the two nails in the coffin for Donald Trump were four hours later, you know. So picture this, the timeline. Lauro and, and uh, Blanche have to report back to their client now on a phone call, Right. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Ex-President, yes, this is John Lauro and Tom. We just met with the government. And how did it go? Well, it's hard to tell. You know, the good part is we were able to get our entire presentation out for a full hour. Oh, that's you just hear Trump. Oh, that's great. And what was the reaction to, you know, the reliance on counsel and the I really believed I won? Well, it's hard to tell. You know, Jack Smith's got that sphinx like <laughs> massage. Really couldn't tell. But uh, we're hopeful, Mr. President. We're we're really hopeful. I'm sure they said it that this will you know impact the indictment decision positively. Oh, that's great. Click. <laughs> and let's just say that was at uh, twelve thirty because I think they had a morning meeting. By four thirty, <laughs> the second indictment in Mar-a-Lago drops. First shoe, boom. <laughs> Donald Donald Trump just you know he probably celebrated all afternoon and then. Boom. And you know, Jack Smith took special delight. If he didn't, we are in the timing of this, right? He said, well, we ready? Is it ready? Is it all? <laughs> we proofed it? All right, file it. And then uh, when they're just, you know, reeling, Trump world is reeling from Mar-a-Lago and the video surveillance conspiracy, there, you know, Donald Trump's attempt to delete it, drown it, bury it, burn it, stab it, get rid of the video surveillance of all the boxes moving in and around Mar-a-Lago. They're just recovering from that one or two news cycles later. Boom, new indictment, DC election interference. Uh, so they, I guess they could only conclude at that point that Laura and Blanche were not successful in their meeting. Just like the earlier lawyers for, for, uh, for Donald Trump, including one that had worked with Jack Smith in the past, back in the Department of Justice, they weren't successful in in uh, heading off at the pass the first Mar-a-Lago indictment. Because when you have as much evidence, truckloads of evidence, I mean, literally, if this wasn't something that was digital, that was two or three terabytes in size, in the old days, this would literally be a tractor trailer or two delivered to the defense. Back it up, Joe. I'm sorry, <laughs> as if Joe Biden's running the truck. Back it up, okay, dump it. And, and that's what happened. And so there's so much evidence that Jack Smith could talk about in the press conference when he when he um, talked about the indictments uh, that we're not in the world of, you know, guessing too much between the Jan 6th report, which is 350 plus pages, uh, and all the presentations that they made and then what we've seen in the indictments and the other things that have been filed in the various courts related to Donald Trump. I mean, as I've said in the prior episodes of Legal AF, there are people on death row who were convicted with one-tenth the amount of evidence that is against Donald Trump right now, despite his whistling in the graveyard behavior by his lawyers and him. We'll continue to follow these kind of developments and the new reporting that came out from Jonathan Carl's new book, his third in a trilogy about the Trump and Trump presidency called Tired of Winning. And this one I thought was particularly interesting because we had done the reporting about, we knew there was a meeting. We reported it on Legal AF on the Midas Touch Network. We knew the results of the meeting. We knew about the indictments one after another, but we didn't know what happened in the room. And and uh, tip of the hat to, to Jonathan Carl for being able to reconstruct what happened in that room. 
from, I'm sure, the, uh, the uh, Department of Justice side of the equation. Follow us on Legal AF. We curate a podcast at the intersection of law, politics, and justice. We do it on Wednesday nights and Saturday nights at 8 p.m. And then on audio platforms, wherever you get your podcast from. Give me a thumbs up on this particular hot tech if you like it. You can find all of my hot takes, my entire body of work. It's about 450 hot takes at this point, all over on the Midas Touch YouTube channel. Free subscribe, help get the 2 million. Look up Michael Popuck under playlist, and you'll see everything that I've done. And again, I'm doing one a, a one a day, if not two or three a day, if there's that much to talk about. So until my next hot take and my next legal AF, this is Michael Popuck reporting. Hey, Midas Mighty, love this report? Continue the conversation by following us on Instagram, at Midas Touch, to keep up with the most important news of the day. What are you waiting for? Follow us now.